Welcome back to the boardroom. I'm Mike Farrington, or as my friends like to call me, Medium Density Farrington, or MDF for short. In this video, I'm going to build a fireplace mantle and cover up an old 70s brick fireplace with some vertical shiplap. Picked up a few sheets of MDF, some poplar, and a few molding profiles and got straight to work. I got started with the shiplap. The brick was about eight feet wide, so the face of each course was going to be about eight inches wide, and I'd have 12 total. My thought was if I made the shiplap and laid it all out on my bench, I could get a better sense of how big the mantle should be. I restored this radial arm saw a while back. I have a video on my channel, check it out. And I just love using it. It was a little scary at first, being that the blade is 16 inches, but it cuts so nice, the dust collection is super good. But most importantly, it looks cool on camera. After the pieces have been cut out, I needed to add the rebates, which are 3 8 by 1 half inch. I buried my dado stack in a sacrificial fence and got to cutting. I like to run each cut through twice just to make sure that I'm getting a consistent cut. Okay, strap yourselves in and prepare to be shocked. I happened to capture the first mistake I have ever made while woodworking on camera. I didn't keep the piece pressed down to the saw surface, so when I put everything together for the first time, the lap joints didn't quite lap right. So I had to go back and run them again. Lesson learned, don't make mistakes. I used some 1 8 inch MDF scraps to create the gaps. Some people suggest using a nickel, but all I had was a credit card and that made the gaps too small. It's important to note that the outermost boards will need some modifying to make sure that all the faces are the same width. On this one, the rabbit should not be cut. And no, I didn't make that mistake first go around. On the other side, the rabbit will need to be cut off. With the shiplap ready to go, I switch gears and begin working on the mantle, and I start with the legs. Virtually all sheet goods have some amount of bow to them. I find the biscuit joiner does a really great job of helping to align and pull the bow out of the parts during glue up, and for this type of work, they're plenty strong. When butt joining MDF, I like to leave a little bit of an overhang. This will be trimmed off later. I much prefer the overhang this way versus the other way. With my biscuit joiner, this is easily accomplished by adjusting the cutter up and down. But this can also be achieved by using some poster board or other thin material as a shim. I made these plywood clamping squares, which help in situations like this. Next, I make the shoes. I use the leg plus two thicknesses of MDF to establish the width of the shoe. Same deal as before, biscuits and gravy. This shot was supposed to be aimed a little bit better. With the legs and shoes glued up, I lay everything in place and decide on the width of the upper section. Once I get that dialed in, I glue that into a box and set it aside to dry. The legs and shoes are now dry enough to deal with the hangover. This is a flush trim bit with a V-groove. It's designed to hide the seam by creating a groove right at that point. This way, as the years go by and the paint cracks at the seam like it always does, it won't be noticeable. Think of this like a control joint in a concrete slab. If I've done the math correctly, this cut will make sure one side of the leg will rest on the shiplap, the other will rest on the bricks. I'm 
the top is two layers of MDF. I'm making some relief cuts in the bottom layer of the top. This will make it easier to glue up because there's less total glue surface area to clamp. Since this seam will show, it is super uber important that the glue line be invisible, hence the relief cuts and lots and lots of clamps. I add a quarter inch quarter round to the top of the shoes, then it's time to gussy them up with some molding. Some glue and Collins miter clamps are the coin of the realm when it comes to installing moldings. I have glued countless miter joints this way and I have yet to have one open up. I use a block plane for flushness and some sandpaper to clean off any glue and perfect the joint. Sanding also seems to remove most of the dimples left from the clamps. I use a single biscuit and then clamp the moldings in place. If it seems like I'm bouncing around a lot, it's because I am. With a project like this, it's important to keep things moving. I'm constantly trying to have something drying while I'm working on something else. Most of the time in a video, I'll edit this out so that it seems more organized. I thought with this one, I would just let it fly and show each step as I do it in order. After cleaning up the top and with the center section dry, it's time to build some more moldings. The first is a clover leaf, which I use to hide the joint between the legs and the center section. Next is the crown molding. Quick tip, when I'm cutting crown, I like to cut it upside down and hold it on the saw at its spring angle, which is the angle that it leans out at. This way I only need to set the saw to the right miter angle, and in this case it's 45 degrees, and whenever possible I like to hold the piece and mark versus trying to measure and then mark. I should also mention at this point, I'm not attaching the moldings to the mantle. I've just glued them up as an assembly. I'll attach them later. The moldings on the shoes were dry enough to trim off the overhang. Here's a look at two router bits I'll be using on the top, a quarter inch round over and an OG or an ogie. I don't know, it could be a soft G. I'm not sure. <laughs> you either get that one or you don't. After I glue the top to the center section, I attach the crown molding. All right, time for song recommendation. Since it's November, let's go with November Rain by Guns N' Roses. I actually wore out my cassette tape playing that song as a kid. It was released in late 1991. And if you wanna feel old, I did some rough math. That is 31 years ago. But all these years later, still a great song. Question for you, the music lover, was Guns N' Roses a hair metal band or not? Next, I attach the clover leaf. I'm using a piece of one quarter inch as a spacer to help me set this molding so that it's hanging down. This will cover the seam where the legs come in. I will also use this space later during install. Hmm, how's that for a tease? When I made the shiplap earlier, I made more than I needed. I wasn't totally sure where the mantle would begin and end. I have that information now, so I make some marks and cut away what's not needed. After dry assembly, I'm pretty happy with how things look. So I move on to how I'm gonna mount the mantle to the wall. This is a French cleat, it's very popular on YouTube these days. I make mine with a shallower angle than most, and I do this just in case the wall has a big hump or some shimming needs to be done. 
a shallower angle makes adjusting and fiddling a little easier. Now it's time to clean up some small details. The outside edges of the shiplap are exposed. Fortunately, I have a double taper sanding disc, which among other things, sands the edge of MDF to a very fine and primer ready surface. If you'd like a disc for your shop, have a look at the link below. I also clean up the edges of fillers and some other random parts at the same time. Pro tip, when adding a round over, I like to set the depth of the bit so it leaves a tiny little lip. Then when I come back and finish sand, I will remove that lip and I won't distort the round over. Here's another pro tip, label your French cleat parts. This will reduce the chance of error from like 90% to like 64%. I give all surfaces a good sanding. For paint grade, I like either 120 or 150 grit. No need to go higher, as I want as much tooth as possible for the primer and paint to grab onto. After that, I perform a thorough vacuuming. If you poured a can of paint onto a bed of sand and let it dry, you could just come back and peel the paint right off. Dust on top of wood does the same thing. Probably a less caveman way of saying that would be dust prevents adhesion. I'm using a shellac-based primer, which is thinned with alcohol, not water. This is critical as water-based primers will cause the MDF and wood fibers to swell up, and then lots and lots of sanding will be needed to get a smooth surface. I'm spraying this through a Harbor Freight spray gun. These are great because they're cheap, but they are a little slow. If I had lots of ground to cover, I would choose a different spray gun. Light denibbing is all that's needed. Really, this is just one or two light swipes and that'll clean off any imperfections. I like to fill nail holes after primer because they're much easier to see at that point, And I know that is very old man of me to say. Once everything's dry, I head over to the job site. Step one is to take the first step and the first step is to install some nailers. These will be affixed to the brick with Tapcon masonry screws and lots of construction adhesive. I mark and drill the holes in the nailers first. Then I use the nailer as a template to locate the holes to be drilled in the brick. I would like to call attention to my very professional glue application method. When working on very uneven surfaces, I like to make sure the adhesive is standing up tall. This will help get as much contact with the brick as possible. Pro tip, do not, and I repeat, do not over tighten any fastener, but especially masonry fasteners. This is no place for an impact driver. It'll just cause the masonry to crumble. I just snug these up until the wiggle is gone. I got a late start on the first day due to an overnight snowfall and the customer's steep gravel driveway, which my van would destroy if things went turbo. So all I got done was installing the nailers. Day two, I move on to the good stuff. I spend a goodly amount of time making sure the first course is nice and plumb. Then I take a break and I go eat a plum. After that, it's a simple matter of popping each course in. Next up, I screw the French cleat in place. Please note, I located a nailer so that I would screw through the cleat, through the shiplap, and then into the nailer. I add left and right cleats so I have something to screw the legs to. I screw the mantle together for the final time and carefully hang it in place. A screw at the bottom of the leg and a couple of nails higher up will lock the mantle in place. I 
I nail the shoes in place and then take a moment to enjoy my surroundings. I'm not going to recite you a poem or anything, but boy am I lucky to have meandered my way into this profession. Spending my days building things for people, helping to improve their homes is truly a pleasure. I don't know if I want to be a carpenter when I grow up, but for now I'll take it. I use a compass to mark my scribe line. I set the compass width to three quarters of an inch and line my board up with the front edge of the shiplap and follow the wall up and down. Then I cut right down to that marked line with a powered hand plane. If I do this accurately, I know the filler will tuck right behind the three quarter inch thick shiplap. But before tucking in the filler, I need to hack out a slice of baseboard. Well, have a look at her. That filler is straight filling. But I don't glue it in place just yet. I'll do that later. Now it's time to top this project off with some crown molding. Now, I don't want to flog this dolphin too much, but I can't overstress the importance of gluing miter joints. Pro tip, add glue to both sides of the joint. To me, miter joints that stay tight for years is what separates the pros from the bush league. Of all of the moldings in a house, crown will be the most visible and therefore the most care should be taken when installing it. I like to do a two-part crown. I think it looks nice but also gives a little more slip. These two parts can be moved up and down. This can help if there's a ceiling that's way out of level or some other wacky situation. In this case though the inner crown covers up the nails that I use to attach the shiplap. With the crown in place, I use a few dollops of construction adhesive and some nails to install the fillers for the final time. And here's how I leave it for the day. I needed to leave early for a family function, so I have to come back for a third day, which again was delayed by snow, to finish things off. Leave it to me to do in three days what should be done in one. I use a couple of 15 gauge finish nails for some additional holding power. I use this super cool spring loaded nail set to make sure they're below the surface. I also tack this filler in place which is hidden behind the clover leaf molding I installed earlier. I like this stuff for filling nail holes. It dries harder and sands better than the drywall filler stuff. When I fill a nail hole, I like to leave it proud. I like to let it dry and then come back and sand it. I think this is the only way to get a really nice looking nail fill. I also caulk all the seams. I use a good quality paintable caulk with silicone in it. I don't want to beat on any one particular brand, but when I first started in this industry, this stuff was rated at like 10 or 15 years. Now we're all the way up to 60 years supposedly, which I'm skeptical at best. I do think the newer stuff stretches a little better which is what you want. This is what's gonna prevent the cracking. Here's where I leave it. Time for the painters to come in and work their magic. I also added a baseboard, which I didn't have time to film, but it does finish off the bottom nicely. This was a fun project. Hopefully you enjoyed following along. If you have any questions, comments, fears, or concerns, state them below. Thanks for watching. Till next time.